Hi everyone, thanks for joining me in this video where I'm going to be building a contemporary walnut coffee table that I've needed for quite a while now. Here I have a 3D model I built in SketchUp of my general plan and I'll cover some of the features of the table here. Starting out, I have the bottoms of the legs tapered on the two inside faces only, then I have the long and short curved stretchers recessed back a quarter of an inch from the face of the legs and a three quarter inch thick bottom shelf, then I have slightly wider curved upper stretchers and a three quarter inch thick top to finish it off. On the underside, you can see a different perspective of the tapered legs and the stretchers, and here you can see a middle brace piece I have in the top to help keep the stretchers straight and add some strength to the base. The base is on the longer side, so the extra stability definitely doesn't hurt. I don't show it here, but I ended up adding one for the bottom stretchers too. Also not shown here is a heavy chamfer I added to the underside of the tabletop and the bottom shelf, and I'll show that step later in the video as well. Here I have a collection of rough sawn walnut of various thicknesses and lengths in my shop. I'm just carefully going through the stack looking for the color and grain that I want. A good trick is to take a damp cloth and wipe the walnut to get a rough idea of what the board would look like once finished. Walnut varies significantly in darkness and color compared to most other species, and I just like to be really deliberate in looking for boards that go together, especially for parts like the top and the shelf. And here you can see some boards that match well enough for me that will end up as part of the lower shelf. Note that some of them are much thicker than the 3 quarter inch thickness I'm going for. Once I have all my boards selected, I use a white pencil to start marking out what boards will make up the tabletop and the shelf. Measure how much material I'll need, and then I'll leave these markings a bit oversized and not to actual dimension just yet so I have a bit of wiggle room down the road. Then I just do the same thing for the legs, marking out their rough thickness and length. And then lastly, I do the same for all the stretchers, using a long straight edge to make measurements and markings on those. After that, I take the boards to the miter saw and use this to cut them to that oversized length. I'm not a big fan of the miter saw for finer finishing cuts, but it's great for me to use when breaking down rough stock like this. After all that, I'm left with all my pieces labeled and cut very roughly to dimension. Then off camera, I used my joiner and planer to mill all my boards to be flat and square enough to work with. I mentioned before that some of the shelf pieces I picked were too thick. Here I'm resawing those boards, which is essentially slicing them in half through their thickness. There's different ways of doing this, but here I'm using my table saw with a feather board that helps provide extra consistent pressure against the fence. I take pass after pass, flipping the board end for end, but keeping the same face against the fence and gradually raising the blade until the board separates. The feather board is great for this as it makes the cut a lot more safe and stable and helps ensure better end results. And here on the final pass you can see the board separate. When you split the boards open after, you get two boards that closely mirror each other in grain and color, and this is called a book match. While aesthetically useful on some projects, I wasn't as concerned with it on this one but thought it was worth showing. I then took even more time checking the boards for the top and the shelf to finalize what orientation I wanted them in. Here for the tabletop, you can see I have two boards that are darker than the others, so I decided to have those two on the outside to keep the tabletop symmetrical in color, and you'll see how that plays out in the end. Again, I really think taking this time with the walnut specifically helps to significantly improve your end results. Next, I use a marking knife and combination square to accurately mark the width of my stretchers, and I only need to do this for one board, and you'll see why in a second. Then I can set my table saw fence to cut the board to that marked width, and then I just leave the fence in place while I cut all the other stretchers that need to be the same width and then rinse and repeat for stretchers of different widths. After that, here are all my stretchers cut to the correct width, but they're all still oversized in length and we'll tackle that step in a couple minutes. Using the same process, I also cut my legs to the correct width. Off camera I planed all the pieces to their final thickness and then started organizing the boards for my bottom shelf the same way I did for the tabletop, paying attention to grain and color and organizing them how I thought looked best. And here some people are going to get annoyed watching this because to align the boards I decided to use my Festool Domino. I want to say up front that the Domino is an expensive luxury tool that is in no way necessary for this project. 
I was fortunate enough to be able to buy one about a year ago, but before that I spent years building a bunch of other projects without it. So if you want to build a coffee table like this, you can do this whole glue up using a biscuit joiner or even just calls to help flatten the boards while they're clamped up. While the domino is convenient for a lot of processes, by no means is it a necessary tool to own. I plunge the domino joiner into the sides of the boards that'll make up the shelf, and then I can use the floating tenons, also known as dominoes, to help hold the boards into alignment while I glue them up. It's important to note too that the dominoes don't add any necessary strength to the joints between the boards in a panel glue up like this. The glue alone would be plenty strong enough to hold the boards together as long as you have good clamping pressure on the shelf as the glue dries. This glue up was actually pretty stressful to get the boards aligned properly myself, and an extra set of hands to help would have been great, so if you're doing a glue up like this and have someone to help, I'd highly recommend that. The glue I decided to use here is Type Bond 3. In addition to having the most open time of the traditional Type Bond glues, it also dries darker than Type Bond 1 and 2 which helps when working with darker woods like walnut. I make sure to get good clamping pressure along the length of the shelf, making sure to alternate clamps below and above it to help prevent bowing. Once the shelf is dry, I take it out of the clamps and set it along the wall out of the way for the time being. Next I cut the legs to length, first by cutting a small part off one end using the crosscut sled on my table saw. Again, you could use a miter saw for this, but I prefer my table saw for finishing cuts. Then from that freshly cut square edge, I measure out the final length of the legs which is 17 and a quarter inches and mark that using my marking knife and combination square. Similar to the width of the stretchers, I only need to mark this on one leg. Then I align that mark with the kerf mark on my crosscut sled. While holding the leg in place, I move my sled stop lock to meet the end of the leg and tighten it down. This stop lock will act as a positive stop, allowing me to make the legs completely uniform in length. I use stop locks or any positive stop jigs to the max extent possible, and I found they make a huge difference in creating uniform pieces. With the stop lock in place, I can cut once, twice, thrice, and whatever the word is for doing something four times. And after all that, this is what I'm left with. Next I take my combination square and mark up three inches from the bottom of my legs on what I determine to be the two inside faces for the taper. And here you also get a great bonus shot of my forearm. I then use a tapering jig on my table saw, which basically orients the board in a way that allows you to cut at a steep angle. I love this jig a little bit ago, but there's tons of plans online to make your own too. After making a pass on one face, I just rotate the board 90 degrees to make a pass on the other inside face. Once that's finished, this is what the legs look like. They don't all end up perfectly, but definitely within sanding tolerances. And here's what all four legs look like when they're oriented together. Next I glued up the top and that went exactly the same as the bottom shelf so I'll save you the glue up montage, but here's what it looked like in clamps. And once that was dry I took it out of the clamps and set it next to its little brother. After that I cut the stretchers to their correct length using the same process as for the legs. For the short stretchers, I was just barely able to use my stop block, pretty much using it at its max offset. For the long stretchers, I cut the ends square and then clamped the ends together with a short F-style clamp while feeling that they're perfectly aligned. Then I just make my cut with both clamped together to ensure that they're the same length. Now to cut the curves on the stretchers. I mark half the length of the stretchers, mark up how high I want the apex of the curve to be, and drive in a nail on the waist side of that line. Then kind of awkwardly using clamps and a quarter inch thick scrap of wood, I create an even bend and mark that bend on the stretcher. After that I take the stretcher to my bandsaw and carefully cut the curve out, making sure not to cut past my line. This takes a good amount of focus and patience, but doing this correctly saves a lot of cleanup on the back end. If you don't own a bandsaw, this could also be done with a jigsaw, albeit probably a bit trickier. 
I then clean up the rough marks, the bandsaw leaves with my card scraper at my workbench, and then after with a flexible sanding strip and 60 grit sandpaper. With one curved stretcher done, I double side tape it to its other matching stretcher and use it as a template at the bandsaw, cutting close to the line, but again not beyond it. With the majority of the waist cut away, I take the taped stretchers to the router table and use a templating bit to cut them to match. The top bearing here rides along the already finished stretcher and the bit's blades are flush with the bearing, cutting the bottom stretcher's profile to match the top. It took a long time to cut all the curves because there were four different curve profiles, but once finished I could lay out the side pieces of the table base and label the left side from the right. I also spent a super long time sanding all of the pieces to 120 grit at this point. It was also really nice seeing the base take shape after all this effort and time. Next I broke out the domino again to do the joinery for connecting the stretchers to the legs. Again, I can't stress enough this is not necessary to do this, and traditional mortise and tenon joinery would work just as well here. I'm only using this for the sake of efficiency to get this table done faster because I really need it for my living room ASAP. I mark out on the legs where to make the mortises and add about an extra quarter inch to the fence setting so the stretchers will be recessed back about a quarter inch from the outside of the legs face. Using a second leg for added support, I then make my mortises in the legs. Here's what that looks like with the lower mortises cut out, but I still have to do the top ones on this piece. With all the mortises cut out, I then take all the stretchers and legs back to the router table, this time using an eighth inch roundover bit to put a subtle rounded profile on the corners so they don't look quite as sharp. The only spot I don't do this on is the tops of the stretchers, as the tabletop and shelf will sit on top of these, and it's better to have a flat surface for those to sit on. Off camera, I finished sanded everything to 180 grit, and then it was time for assembly. I started by only doing the side pieces of the base, opting to do the whole base glue up in two phases because this would be pretty tricky to do by myself all at once without messing something up. I make sure to use enough glue to bring the joint together and to hold it, but I also don't want to have too much squeeze out which would require a lot of cleanup and sanding later on. With the two sides dried and out of clamps, I do a dry assembly of the whole base together to get my first look at what it'll end up being like. At this point in the build, I usually start using referential measurements, meaning I measure the piece itself instead of going strictly off the plans. Wood moves and there's always some level of imperfect measuring or cutting, and I've found for me that referential measurements work best around this point. With that being said, I measure the distance between the long stretchers near the legs and off camera cut the brace pieces to that length. Here you can see the brace fits snugly between the long stretchers right near the legs, but there's a large gap when I move it near the middle of the base. This shows that the long stretchers are slightly bowed outward, and this brace piece will help me keep them straight. Using the domino again, I cut the mortises at the midpoint of the stretchers, and into the ends of the braces as well. While the domino is certainly quick and efficient, you still have to be really careful and deliberate about where you're plunging and how deep. Now it's time for the base glue up. This ended up being super stressful because despite multiple dry fits and having everything set up beforehand, I swear I lose 30 IQ points every time I start gluing things together. The size of this base made it really awkward to do by myself, and again a second set of hands would have made this way easier. I was definitely glad I elected to do the side pieces in a separate stage because it would have been impossible to do the whole thing at once. I'll take this time for a little foreshadowing and just say that for projects this large and with several pieces, do your due diligence and think of anything that could possibly go wrong and consider if there are better ways to do things. You'll see why I say this in just a couple minutes. And right about here you can see me panicking because I put the wrong length of domino in the brace pieces and jumped on the assembly table to yank them out with a pair of pliers. Luckily the glue hadn't set too much and I could get them out and continue on with the rest of the glue up. Luckily at this point there were no other major issues and I was able to get clamps on and let it dry. Once dry and out of the clamps, this is what the finished base looked like. I was really happy because it came out perfectly flat and square, obviously ideal for a table base. Next up was to sand the tabletop and the shelf and cut them to dimension. The sanding took quite a while because of the sheer surface area, but I got through it in a couple hours. Here I'm using my track saw to cut the tabletop, and I could have used my table saw itself, but I just thought the track saw would be easier, and I also wouldn't have a good way of doing the cross cuts on the table saw. With one side cut, I could reference a drywall square off of it and use that to align my track for the cross cuts. 
I then take the bottom shelf and clamp it to the side of my bench and use a combination square and pencil to mark out the notches on the corners where it'll reference off the legs. Then using my crosscut saw, I cut deep enough for the teeth to be embedded and break out a magnetic handsaw jig to ensure my cuts are square. I haven't done a ton of handsawing recently and didn't want to jeopardize the shelf at this stage, so I decided to cheat with the jig. Once I cut to my line, I rotate the shelf 90 degrees and use my dovetail saw to do the rip cut to remove the corner. You could do these cuts with a power tool, maybe the bandsaw or a jigsaw, but for me I definitely found this to be the easiest and most satisfying way of doing these cuts. There is still a little bit of waste material left in the corners, but nothing a chisel can't easily clean up. And with that, the bottom shelf was roughly finished, and other than sanding, it was ready for a dry fit. And then this is when disaster hit. The bottom shelf was fully cut to size, but I had never considered whether I'd be able to fit it inside the base after it had been glued up, and I definitely could not. I mean, I wanted this from every possible angle, twisting and turning the shelf, and there was no way to get it inside the base. I couldn't believe I hadn't thought through this, and I had spent literally half an hour staring at this thinking about my options. I even considered scrapping the bottom shelf altogether, and while it probably visually would look fine, it'd be a constant reminder to me every time I saw the table how badly I had messed up. I think that goes to show no matter your experience level or how nice of a 3D model or materials you have, major mistakes can happen and it's all about how you recover from it. It was actually my dad, a decades long woodworker, who gave me the idea I went with, which was to cut the shelf lengthwise, fit the shelf in in two pieces, and glue it back together inside the base. While definitely not ideal, I thought this was the best of all the bad options before me. So thanks for that, Dad. I know you're watching. So getting back to work, I break out the track saw again and rip the board lengthwise. I took some measurements beforehand, and I determined that I didn't have to cut the shelf in half, but could just cut it at the first panel glue line from before and it would fit, so I opted for that. It was kind of cool though, that by cutting along the previous glue line I was exposing the dominoes from earlier in the project. It would obviously be covered again when I glued the shelf back together, but it was neat briefly seeing the cross section. And then I could try the two shelf pieces inside the base, and sure enough they fit. Off camera I also used the domino to create mortises on the insides of the stretchers. I'll show this later, but this will be for hardware that will end up holding the shelf and the top in place. At this time I decided to brand the inside of one of the upper stretchers with a brand my good friend Marissa got me a couple of years ago. I don't always remember to use it on every project, but I definitely wasn't going to forget on this one. After a little bit of sanding, here's how it looks. At this point I decided to pre-finish the base. I figured finishing it now would be better for gluing the shelf back together later, as a lot of the areas would be harder to reach then. Also, if there was any glue squeeze out from the shelf, hopefully the oil finish now would prevent that glue from getting into the wood. I'm using Rubio Monocoat here, which is usually my go-to finish. It's super easy to mix and apply, and it usually only takes one coat. The application is super easy too, and I just use a white Scotch-Brite pad to work it into the wood grain, let it sit for a few minutes, and come back and wipe off the excess with a microfiber cloth. Here I'm using their walnut variety, which I had heard isn't a stain so much as a variation of the formula to be used on walnut. I'm not sure this is accurate, and truthfully I ended up not caring for it much, as I thought it unnaturally darkened the already dark walnut, and I noticed a mild splotching in some of the grain. Still, I didn't hate it, and definitely wasn't going to redo the base. I decided to go back to their pure variety for the top and the shelf, which is my regular go-to for them, and is more akin to a clear version of the hard wax oil finish. Going back to the tabletop and shelf, I used my trim router with a 45 degree chamfer bit to chamfer the undersides. I do this in multiple passes, taking more off each time. It's important to do multiple passes when taking off this much material, both for safety and better results. After that, I set up the base to re-glue the bottom shelf. Here I've added some cardboard and tape to the lower stretchers to help protect them from the clamps for the shelf. I get everything lined up, glue the extra piece, and clamp the shelf back together. Again, I apply clamps both below the shelf and above it to mitigate any bowing at the joint. I also use a clamp briefly at the ends as a call to force the boards to be coplanar, and I ended up being pretty happy with the final result, although it did require a little bit of sanding after. Once dry, I removed the clamps and the cardboard.
I did have a couple cracks and voids in the top and shelf, none of which were structurally problematic, but I did want to handle them for aesthetic reasons, so I took to doing that next. I decided to use black tinted epoxy to fill these voids, and I've always had good results doing this, especially in darker wood species. The black tint helps the epoxy blend right in, and you don't even typically notice it's there on the final product. It's really important with epoxy to tape off the areas really well where you're going to pour. Epoxy has a tendency to spread and go places you don't expect, so preparation for that's important. I then mix the resin in the hardener, add in the black dye, and stir really well. Epoxy works through chemical reaction, so it's crucial to make sure it's mixed well, poured properly, and cures in an environment at an appropriate temperature. Then I just dab the epoxy into any of the cracks and voids. None of these are especially large, so I don't need to pour in a ton. I also like to come back with a small heat gun periodically and quickly hit the spots, which pops any air bubbles on the surface that would give a less than ideal result later on. Slowly over time, the epoxy will work its way down, and it's important to come back every few minutes and add more if you see a cavity forming around the void. The goal is to have it cure with a small spot above the surface of the wood, which you can then sand back to the surface after it cures. Here you can see what I mean by the epoxy getting places you don't expect. After a little while, it worked its way entirely through the board to the underside, and I was fortunate it cured here before dripping onto my assembly table. Once cured, I come back with my random orbital sander and sand it down. I try not to keep the sander entirely in one place so as to not create any low spots on the surface. After I'm down to the surface again, you can see with the damp cloth here how the black epoxy blends right in. After sanding up through the grits to 180 for the tabletop and the shelf, it was time to finish those. As I said before, I opted for Rubio Monaco Pure here, pouring it onto the surface and rubbing it into the grain with a white scotch bright pad before removing the excess with a microfiber cloth. For the shelf, I flipped the base upside down to finish the bottom first before flipping it upright again to do the top. I was really excited to see how these large flat surfaces would look, and thankfully I wasn't disappointed. After all the unexpected stress and setbacks on this project, I was happy to see the end was in sight. I do the same with the tabletop, starting on the underside and applying the oil finish before flipping it and doing the top. I'd like to take a second and say if you've made it this far, I truly appreciate you taking the time to watch this video, and I hope you've gotten something positive out of it. Building this table itself and making this video has been a long process for me, and I appreciate you joining me for the ride. Once the finish dried, I could get to the final step of attaching the shelf and the tabletop. Here I'm somewhat awkwardly getting under the table to screw in the Z-clips that'll hold the shelf in place. I aligned the shelf to the lower stretchers, clamped it in place, and could then insert the hardware. Here you can see how the clips fit into the mortises I plunged earlier, and they screw into the shelf to create a downward pressure on the stretchers. With a couple of the Z-clips in place, I could flip the table to get easier access to the rest of the locations. The main benefit of these clips is that they allow for seasonal wood movement of the shelf and top. Wood expands and contracts across its grain in this direction here, and the clips on the side can slide in and out of the mortise with the expansion and contraction. And the clips here in the middle have room on the left and the right for when they move. In this way, the clips hold the shelf and top down while still allowing it to move laterally. Lastly, I attach the top in the same way I attached the shelf. The top has just a little bow to it, so I lightly clamp it to the stretcher while inserting the hardware. The bow here isn't terrible, but this measure helps eliminate most of it. And once I remove the clamp, it springs back just a tiny bit, but well within my tolerances for a coffee tabletop. And with that, this project is done. And here it is in its final space. I'm extremely happy with how this table turned out, and it was a much needed addition to my living room. I've used it for a couple days now, and it was absolutely worth all the effort and stress. Again, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this video, and if you've gotten anything out of this, please consider liking and subscribing for similar content in the future. And if you have any questions, please feel free to hit me up and I'll do my best to get back to you. Thank you.